It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the next session on Model Integrated Evidence for Genetic Drug Development. We're going to hear from two speakers from the industry side and the FDA. The first talk is given by Dr. Amin Rustami, who is a professor of systems pharmacology at the University of Manchester and one of the leading minds in the field of physiologically based pharmacokinetics and quantitative systems pharmacology. He is internationally recognized for his expertise in the use of in vitro information to predict the behaviors of drugs in the human body, as well as associated inter-individual variabilities on the so-called bottom-up modeling approach. In 2017, he was recognized as one of the highest cited researchers in the area of pharmacology and toxicology. He co-authored more than 280 papers that had been cited more than 17,000 times. In addition to his academic position, Dr. Rustami is also the Senior Vice President for Research and Development and Chief Scientific Officer in CERTAR. He will be sharing an industry perspective on community trust in modeling and simulation, the move from scientific curiosity to integrated industrial applications. Dr. Rustami's talk will be followed by the talk by Dr. Lian Zhao. Dr. Lian Zhao is the director of the Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling within the Office of Research and Standards in the FDA's Office for Generic Drugs. He has broad scientific and management experience both in industry and in the FDA. Dr. Zhao had worked in Madame Yun on biotechnology products, in Bristol Myers Clip on small molecule drug development, and in consulting company Farsight on the development of new drugs product. He is a recognized leader in quantitative methods and modeling and model-based strategic decision-making in regulatory and industrial settings for both generic and new drugs. His talk will follow Dr. Rastami and he will offer an FDA's perspective on model integrated evidence for generic drug development. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you and share some thoughts with regard to challenge one related to this particular workshop today. Let me share with you first uh, my conflict of interest via this slide and also put a disclaimer that all the views that they are expressed as part of this presentation, they are my own and do not represent uh, the organizations that I'm affiliated to. Uh, my first proposition as true um, is that uh, modeling and simulation uh, has matured enough. Uh, but at the same time, I'm proposing that modeling and simulation is not ingrained in pharmaceutical drug development. And as part of that, I'm going to discuss today the vertical versus lateral expansion of the modeling and simulation. This particular example uh, might be an easier way to look at this particular issue of the lateral expansion uh, that relates to automobiles and uh, the uh, racing cars where we have got the cars and drivers in a different category than the scaled up usage of the cars on the road for going to work and, and going for shopping and, and so on. Whilst the, in the first case, in the left-hand side, you are uh, very susceptible to many breakpoints and so on because you are testing many aspects. In fact, in the right-hand side, you have got much more robust system because they are on the tested products. And scaling up means that uh, you are getting rid of you know, some of the um, available options in the left-hand side, but at the same time, you are making it uh, more reliable for wider uh, group. Therefore, we are not talking about uh, toys for big boys uh, with regard to the modeling and simulation anymore. We are talking about modeling for all. It is undeniable that commercial um, tools for modeling and simulation, they have uh, influence the lateral expansion in the same way that this has happened with many other areas like automobile industry or mobile phone and, and so on. So the lateral expansion is more of a management issue rather than science, going from the vision of modeling and simulation being ingrained to actual change that they are happening. And we have to address incentives, skills, resources, and action plan as part of this management. The vision 
is something that uh, the regulatory side has had it since uh, the publication of Critical Path Initiative in 2004. Um, and therefore, this cannot be considered as uh, something that is lacking. However, many people may say that there are not enough incentives uh, and therefore the changes are happening in uh, gradual mode rather than going uh, rapidly. And this is certainly changing. But imagine if the incentives were in place and then there were some requests from the regulatory side, but then the skills were not matching to produce such a, um, products and bring them as part of the application. Uh, this is both in the uh, sponsor side as well as in the regulatory side, and that will cause lots of anxiety. Uh, similarly, if the skills are in place, but then uh, resources, uh, they uh, are such that they cannot address, for instance, assessment of thousands of the codes on open source code, uh, that will also will cause frustration. And finally, if uh, the action plan is not in place, uh, then we will have some uh, false starts, but eventually we will get there. This particular publication, uh, I ask uh, everybody who's interested in open source code to have a look at this because this is basically summarizing the situation with the high level mechanistic models in biology and what the open source code is actually giving us. Reproducibility is an issue with these systems, uh, even when they are peer reviewed articles and, and published. For a variety of reasons, you can't work them. And this is not good when you are talking about the regulatory space. There are lots of confusion. Uh, recently, we looked at this uh, using the statistics of the PBPK that uh, people uh, consider access in the same line as uh, open source code. While open source code could be commercial platform like MATLAB, for instance, and at the same time, you can have non-open source code that they are freely available for the uh, academic groups. And in fact, the statistics, they were showing that you know, the academic groups for the research non-for-profit activities, they didn't have any problem. And three quarter of the publications, in fact, they were related, associated, affiliated uh, with uh, the commercial platforms. So let me just uh, clarify that nobody is in favor of black box uh, when it is not clear how you get from certain input to certain out come from the model, but at the same time, I am in favor of what I have coined as glass box, when everything is transparent, uh, but certain elements, they are defined within a glass box uh, that not everybody can access to those codes and change them, but certain individuals, when needed, they have got, the, they are the key holders for it and they can be given access. Therefore, this system, while it is transparent, it is not allowing every single user to be able to go and modify the code and this reduces the burden of the assessment enormously. Now, this may also cause some problem because uh, with many of the modelers, they consider their own model as the best. And hence my title here, my model, your model, his model, her model, whose model. All the time the fight is there that whose model is performing better. But in reality, when you look at you know, the models in a blinded fashion, which is a big struggle that we had and we did it in Orbido with a it's an IMI project in Europe with uh, a specific publication on how we actually manage this uh, blinding of the outcome uh, initially to the uh, modelers. Um, in the result was surprisingly was saying that the model is not the major element of the variability, but the modelers are the major element of the variability. There were some differences between platforms when you are using the same uh, set of data and, and getting different outcome, but they were not the majority of the case. Um, hence, if you want to actually really ingrain the modeling and simulation in the biopharmaceutics area, we have to look at you know, what happened in other areas like uh, applications in drug-drug interaction. In the heart of the matter was integration of different activities together. Um, and as part of that, 
different players came together. So this is not just regulators, this is not just academic centers and research institutes, but also the drug companies, as well as CROs, and in the biopharmaceutics case, CMOs, and patient groups who wanted to make sure that uh, faster drug development is also for safer drug development, and we are not compromising on anything. This particular publication uh, also was, uh, I think, a, a milestone indicating separation of the platform qualification from the model verification and uh, how the sponsors uh, can avoid unnecessary delays with regard to the assessment of their model if the platform is already qualified and the only thing that is going to be assessed as part of their application is the model verification and what they have done with their data. Now moving to the vertical expansion, uh, we have got all the vision in place, we have got records of the progress that they are happening, uh, we have identified uh, several areas, but we have to consider that the majority of the complex uh, generics, they involve non-oral routes, and, and that means that we have to be focusing on identifying physiological and biological attributes of such organs. And then we have to actually examine the drugs in the systems that they are derived from such tissues. And separation of the drug data from systems data, uh, they are already known. I refer you to this 2012 uh, publication that says how it is done. There is one other issue with regard to their test systems, and that is the outputs from these systems uh, normally are used in the form of a single point, which are semi-quantitative at its best. However, we would like to move on from these, and like the case of the transporter affinity, rather than relying on A to B, B to A ratio, which is useless when it comes to the quantitative modeling, we use actual dynamics that's linked to the concentration and abundance of the certain transporter. Similar areas in the dissolution are very well known. Rather than a single point of percentage dissolved at a given time, we would like to know how that dissolution is happening in relation to the biosol, pH, shear stress, and many other factors. The bigger gap that we have got with the pharmaceutics, in fact, is that we are not talking about the API alone, but the combination of the excipients and the formulation um, ingredients with the APR, they are going to uh, be also assessed in each of these systems. But fortunately, uh, OGD has been sponsoring many of such studies on excipients, and uh, recently we are seeing that the common excipients, now they are having their own database that people can use such data uh, in these mechanistic models. When it comes to the system models, uh, unfortunately, uh, there has been uh, more effort in the oral side, while when we come to area such as, uh, let's say, dermal, there is uh, only one publication on the proteomics of human skin that uh, our group did uh, a couple of years ago, and all other areas, they are having uh, uh, some uh, sparse data, um, and this is something that uh, hopefully is going to be addressed because they were as part of the calls for different uh, uh, grant applications by OGD in 2021. Uh, On a positive note, when all of these elements come together, indications are that virtual bioequivalence is accepted by the agency. And uh, last year in May, Dr. Cho indicated uh, one such case as a research highlight by OGD and uh, that is something that I'm glad now it is in fact published and uh, it is available in this particular uh, report in the CPT where uh, the path for getting virtual bioequivalence on the basis of in vitro data combined with modeling are shown. So let me emphasize again that we are not short of models when we are moving even other areas like pulmonary drug absorption.
knew about the computational fluid dynamic models. They have progressed a lot over the uh, last two decades. Uh, this afternoon, uh, Daniel and Andre are going to talk about it. But uh, one thing to actually to tell you is that uh, the disposition models for the local, what's happening in the, let's say, in the pulmonary area uh, and intercorrelation, they have not been adequately combined with the uh, CFD models. Uh, and when it comes to other areas like, like ocular as well, we are not again short of models but we are short of the system data going into these models, as well as integration, verification, and building consensus, and increasing the options for the user. Passing the bioequivalence uh, requires not just the average formulation being able to show the relative uh, bioavailability similar to the reference drug, but also the variation that you are having for relative bioavailability within certain range. What causes this uh, variability, even when you are testing the reference against itself, is the interocasion variability that we have got in different physiological parameters associated with the system. And these, despite being the same for biology and physiology, they are going to influence different drugs and different formulations in different ways. So the manifestation on the CMAX, TMAX, and AUC, they are going to be different, but the key issue is that whether we can predict that for a given formulation and given drug. And to be able to do that, of course, we can plug in various kinds of uh, uh, permutation of parameters for physiological um, interocasion variability, but some of them will be incompatible with what we have observed. However, if we did this only for one formulation, one drug, we may not get the full picture because each of the formulation and drugs, they will be excluding certain uh, sets of parameters, but other sets that this drug or this formulation is not sensitive to, we won't have any idea what the numbers are for those. At the same time, we are sitting on a gold mine of studies that they are on the basis of uh, repeat of the reference or repeat of the test. And, and these are giving the possibility of in a big array of the data to be analyzed with the mechanistic models with different permutations of interocasion variability. And once they are settled for the physiology and, and the biology, because they are drug and formulation independent parameters, they can be used prospectively for predicting any other formulation and any other drug. And they could be integrated to any dedicated module for virtual bioequivalence, and uh, people don't need to be a modeler to necessarily to be able to use such models. Uh, this brings me to this summary with regard to the um, consensus building with regard to integration of uh, the system parameters, as I mentioned, to increase the modeling for in vitro data and uh, give more incentives by publicizing the cases that they are accepted, use more reverse translational models for uh, historic data to give us more insight into physiology and biology and, and forget about that specific drug, apply these in a big array of um, drug formulation uh, matrix and, uh, of course, we may need some Bayesian uh, fitting in, in all those cases. Of course, we need to allow for um, occasional off-the-road uh, racing cars to be exploring the edges and the limits of the modeling and simulation. But these are not, in my view, the major reason uh, that we didn't have the lateral expansion. And we need certainly to define guidance and SOPs uh, for those uh, licensed drivers who want just to drive their robust cars on the main road for routine applications. I will stop here and I will be taking any questions during the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liang Zhao, Director for the Division of Quantitative Method Modeling. It is my great pleasure to present and seek your inputs on model integrated evidence for generic drug development. There are four main areas in regulatory science to support BE evaluations, in vitro and in vivo BE methods, drug device combinations, and post-market surveillance of generic drugs. 
QMM is underlying all of them and plays a pivotal role in the modernization of linear drug development and assessment. Model integrated evidence, MIE, refers to using model generated information such as the virtual B simulation result, not just to plan a pivotal study, but to serve as the pivotal evidence. MIE can directly support product approval or in combination with relevant in vitro B testings, it can support alternatives to conventionally recommended in vivo B studies. Quantitative method of modeling in combination with MEE has made a great impact on a broad spectrum of regulatory and research activities. For regulatory activities, the DKMM division has been involved in a large amount of under review consults, pre under meetings, controlled correspondences, and guidance development. For research activities, they include both internal research products within FDA as well as GUDUFA science and research contracts and grants. For example, in under review consults, modeling and simulation allow the assessment of effects of particle size deviations on BE. Those scale analysis with high data censoring rates and model based comparative clinical and the data analysis, which have led to under approvals, alternative approvals. I want to mention that whenever there is an emergency, QMM can offer quick solutions as a first resort. There is no difference in the event of a COVID-19 pandemic. The unexpected and unprecedented event impacted clinical study execution, including PKB studies, due to various reasons as shown here. One critical question arose. If a reference product expired in an ongoing pivotal PKB study, which has been interrupted due to the pandemic, especially for fully replicated studies, the two batches of reference products have to be used, how to evaluate the B results? Modeling simulation showed that alternative analysis approaches may be used to incorporate batch difference for BE establishment. The acceptability of the B result is based on study type, medical method, and it can be case specific. One regulatory decision tree has been presented in the 2020 AAM annual conference, and the link is shown below. Here, I want to give you a highlight for the use of the pharmacometrics tools to support one of the first general approval in 2020. Albutro sulfate inhalation aerosol is a beta-2 adrenergic agonist indicated for the treatment or prevention of bronchospasm in patients four years of age and older. It is a public health emergency designated COVID-19 generic drug product. However, the PDB bronchoprovocation study conducted by the applicant included considerable amount of censored values in the PC20 data in 26% of the subjects. The question is how to assess PDB under high incidence of data sensory. FDA's internal analysis adopted a more, more than likelihood-based uh, modeling approach to perform data imputation for censored values. This modeling approach supported the final approval as one of the first generics in 2020. PBPK modeling has been growing as one of the key tool sets for B assessment. In a recent case, the PVPK modeling simulation has led to a pivotal regulatory decision making for a capsule product. It has been reported that the PK parameters are sensitive to the particle distribution of the drug. Particle size distribution division in terms of the 90 between test and reference products has caused the non-B concerns during the review. The key question here is, what is the impact of a PSD division on BE? In this case, the FD assessor performed a PVPK simulation based on internally updated model. The modeling results suggested that the test versus reference PK parameters showed a low risk of a non-BE when D90 varied over a wide range. 
the modeling results supported the B conclusion for this ANDA. Additionally, the simulation outcomes can be readily extrapolated to set a clinically relevant three-tier PSD safe space for future reference. Here, I want to illustrate further thoughts on advancing QMM and model integrated evidence for complex products. For in vitro characterization-based B assessment, we can use QMM to identify clinically relevant attributes and the associated B space. Modeling and simulation for in vitro testing result can also open up new opportunities for research. For example, the model characterization of IVPT results can not only save us from a fully blown IVPT study, but also increase the credibility of a model predictions for drug biodistribution in the skin. Results from modeling simulation can serve as alternative approaches to replace conventionally recommended comparative PD or clinical endpoint B studies. Please attend a breakout session 1A if, uh, if you are interested in how MIE can be applied in orally inhaled products. You can also attend a session 1B if you are particularly interested in using MIE for lactating injectables. There are also big room for modeling usage for non-complex products, including oral dosage forms. Please attend session 3A if you want to participate on the topic of using MIE to support a big program with a lean or waived in vivo BE assessment. Furthermore, we wanted to weigh in your opinion on BCS3 waiver for more general cases not conducting FATB studies in high confidence scenarios, justification for lower strength waiver under special conditions. Please attend a breakout session 1B and a 3B if you want to attend and participate in the discussion for in vivo B programs with novel study designs. Breakout session 1B will focus on model based B program for long acting injectables again. PBPK modeling tools also play important roles in terms of extrapolating B result from healthy volunteers to pediatric and geriatric populations and from healthy to patient populations. With the emerging technologies and models in AI and machine learning, we also want to see our input in breakout session 1C in terms of empirical in vitro in vivo connections, improving conventional pharmacometrics tool sets and knowledge management and information collection. Industrial implementation of the QMM approaches not only depends on the investment on scientific research, but also depends on more efficient communications between the agency and the industry, on expectations in the modeling package and regulatory acceptances and uses of different models. If you are you, you are welcome to share your thoughts and comments on how FDA and the industry could have effective communication. Finally, for summary topics as enlisted below, we are looking forward to seeing you in the model integrated evidence sessions in the afternoon. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Our next talks are from two distinguished experts in the area of complex product characterization and analysis. The first talk will be given by Dr. Zdenko Cesar, who is the Director of Early Stage Development at Lek Pharmaceuticals in Slovenia, which is a part of Sandoz Pharmaceuticals. His expertise is in product development, scale-up, and industrial-scale manufacturing for classical as well as complex generic products. He is also a full professor of medicinal chemistry at the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Ljubljana. The main area of his research and development work are linked to the synthesis of active pharmaceutical ingredients, drug analysis, and drug stability. 
He will be sharing an industry perspective on complex product characterization and analysis challenges for oligon nucleotides and liposomal drug products. The second talk will be given by Dr. Rachel Dunn, who is the director of the Division of Pharmaceutical Analysis within the Office of Testing and Research in the FDA's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. Prior to FDA in industry, she held position both in the lab and the management at Kemar Analytical Services as a director of technical services. In academia, Dr. Dunn supervised the operations and staff of the chemistry department at Washington University in St. Louis. Her talk will follow Dr. Cesar's and will offer FDA's perspective on scientific approaches for analytical characterization of complex generic products. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Denko Chasar. I am head of early stage development Slovenia at Sandor. It is my great pleasure to have this opportunity and present to you some challenges associated with analytical characterization of oligonucleotide and liposomal drug products. In my talk, I will try to demonstrate why liposomal drug products and oligonucleotide therapeutics are complex and difficult to develop for generics. I will also highlight the origin of complexity for these drugs with some examples. Recently, lipid nanoparticle formulation was used in oligonucleotide patisserin, which brings some of the complexity found on liposomal drug products also to therapeutic oligonucleotide space. So let's start with liposomal drug products. Liposomes are microscopic artificial vesicles of spherical shape in which an aqueous volume is entirely enclosed by a membrane composed of phospholipid bilayers. They are very useful drug delivery systems. This enables effective delivery of encapsulated compounds to target sites while minimizing systemic toxicity. Liposomes can be classified as multilamellar vesicles or unilamellar vesicles. Liposomal drug products entered the market more than 25 years ago. The most interesting examples of marketed products in this class are doxorubicin, amphotericin B, verteporfin, bupivacaine, vincristine, irinotecan, citerabine, downorubicin, and amikacin. Nevertheless, generic market penetration in this segment is very low, despite the fact that FDI provided general and several product-specific guidances. In fact, only liposomal doxorubicin was put on the market as a generic version. Therefore, this situation warrants some further discussion and analysis. In the past, several types of critical quality attributes were identified for liposomal drug products. For example, identification and quantification of lipid precursors, quantification of the encapsulated free and total API, characterization of nanoparticles which include morphology, structure, particle size distribution, and surface charge, physical and chemical stability of the product, and in vitro release kinetics of entrapped API. Based on these CQAs, there are numerous characterization requirements in product-specific guidances, as shown for doxorubicin example. Tests that are also required in product-specific guidances for other liposomal drug products are highlighted in bold. The reason behind a very low generic market penetration on these products is probably linked to the fact that in addition to BE studies, large number of CQA need to be addressed with characterization of the product using advanced analytical techniques. This makes liposome drug products difficult to develop for generics. Now I will try to demonstrate liposomal product complexity with challenging characterization and its, and its interpretation on a specific case. Product-specific guidances require equivalent liposomal characteristics for generic product versus the RLD. 
Among key parameters are lipos liposomal morphology and state of encapsulated drug. On the picture, we have an example of an RLD where three different particle morphologies can be observed. Spherical particles filled with API, marked with red arrow, oval particles containing intraliposomal API precipitates, marked with blue arrow, distorted particles containing intraliposomal API per precipitates, and a sort of a bubble, marked with green arrow. Clearly, the amount of these different particle types varies between different lots of RLD. Ambiguity related to equivalent liposome characteristics in this case are associated to the influence of heterogeneity of particle morphology and size on the performance of this drug. Criteria when should a generic product be considered similar to RLD and methodology that should be used to establish such similarity. This brings us to oligonucleotide therapeutics, which can be in fact considered as big small molecules based on their molecular weight, which spans in the range of approximately 5 to 16 kilodalton. Based on their molecular size, they fit between therapeutic peptides and biologics. They are also relatively new modalities. On one hand, they possess several features like high molecular weight, they are mixtures of different related molecules in some cases, and they are difficult to characterize in terms of composition and heterogeneity, which links them to large molecules. On the other hand, they are chemically synthesized, they are made by predictable chemical processes, they possess defined structure, independent of manufacturing process, and usually they have no high order structure except for aptomers, which makes them similar to small molecules. Deeper look into the chemical structure of therapeutic oligonucleotides reveals that they are short DNA RNA strands containing typically 15 to 13 nucleotide units. They are chemically modified, which improves pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, as well as in vivo stability of these drugs. Based on the fact that they are also relatively new modalities, regulatory landscape is very limited. Oligonucleotide therapeutics are approved via a new drug application procedure under the considered as chemical entities. Recently, FDA issued some draft guidances for sponsor investigators which are related to non-clinical testing of antisense oligonucleotides and investigational new drug application submissions for individualized antisense oligonucleotide drug products. These guidances are, however, linked to the originator's products. At the moment, no general CMC guidance exists for oligonucleotide therapeutics and they are specifically excluded from some ICH guidances. However, some industry-wide paper provides suggestions on the CMC part for oligonucleotides. In generic domain, product-specific guidances are not yet published. However, 
FDA recently put nusinersen on the list of upcoming product-specific guidances. The space of oligonucleotide therapeutics expanded significantly since 2016, while some products that have been approved before that were discontinued. We can see that complexity of oligonucleotide drugs originates from the API as well as from the FDF part. On the API side, single-stranded and double-stranded RNA as well as GANAC and other conjugates are known. Nevertheless, most of the products are single-stranded RNA derivatives. On the FDF side, products are formulated as liquid in vials, combination products and uh, lipid nanoparticles formulations in vials. All this raises huge complexity for the characterization of these drugs in the area of API and FDF. Oligonucleotide therapeutic complexity arising from API side are linked to the relatively complex process for their preparation, which consists of long approximately 80-step synthesis on solid support, followed by chromatography purification, the salting and lyophilization. Due to the long synthetic sequence used, Crude material is mixture of full-length product and numerous related impurities. For example, for oligonucleotide that contains 20 nucleotide units, approximately 80 synthetic steps are needed. And for coupling efficiency of 99%, only approximately 82% purity is achieved. Therefore, extensive API characterization with advanced analytical methods is needed. Based on their structure, there are several types of oligonucleotide-related impurities that are not found in other drug products. They can be clustered into four categories. The first category are modified full-length impurities which have correct length but are modified at a single internucleotide linkage, single nucleotide residue or single base residue. They are often a mixture of positional isomers. The second category are deletion sequences, also called shortamers N minus X, and addition sequences called longamers N plus X, where most abundant are usually N plus 1 and N minus 1 sequences. They are a mixture of components differentiated by the location of deletion or of the repeat. They are formed due to the defects in the coupling step. The third category are impurities with the same structure and sequence as parent compound, but are missing several nucleotides from either end. Finally, the fourth category are higher molecular weight impurities like dimers that are linked through base-base, sugar-sugar, internucleotide linkage, internucleotide linkage cross-linking, or their combinations. Based on the long synthetic sequence and possible failures that can occur in this sequence, unique and complex impurity profile is expected in therapeutic oligonucleotides, as demonstrated on previous slides. To address this complexity, in impurity profile, combination of ion pair reverse phase liquid chromatography in combination with UV or MS detection is required. LC-UV is usually used to determine deletion sequences and addition sequences up to N-2 and from N-2. All the colluting impurities of the parent compound, which usually include N-1, N-1, various full-length impurities, mono-PO impurities, N+, protecting group impurities, etc., must be therefore determined by LCMS approach. To conclude, as it was shown during this talk, 
Liposomal and oligonucleotide drug products are already well established in the innovator space, but almost non-existent in the generic domain. Required extensive analytical testing beyond B studies probably delays generic development of liposomes. Therefore, it would be useful to develop understanding which changes in physiochemical characteristics actually impact B outcomes. Also, development of standardized analytical characterization methods for liposomes, like morphology, in vitro release, and stress testing would be, would be beneficial for generic industry. Establishment of product-specific guidances and general guidance for oligonucleotides would be very welcome and would accelerate development of generic products. Research on CQAs to demonstrate oligonucleotide API sameness and guidance on acceptable levels of impurities would also be required. Finally, development of standardized methods for oligonucleotide purity and impurities characterization would be also very useful. With this, I would like to finish my presentation and thank you very much for your attention. Hello, and thank you, Dr. Cesar, for your interesting talk on the characterization challenges for oligonucleotide and liposomal drug products. I'm Rachel Dunn. I'm the director for the Division of Pharmaceutical Analysis in the Office of Testing and Research, which is in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality in CEDAR. And today I'm going to introduce the topics that will be covered in this afternoon's breakout session on complex products analysis and characterization. But first, I'll give a brief introduction to the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and describe how the gadufa funded collaborative research we participate in with the Office of Generic Drugs positively impacts OPQ's ability to review characterization data in ANDAS. OPQ proactively pursues both a science and a research program, and the science program is designed to maintain preparedness and to respond to consumer complaints and public health issues by identifying fit-for-purpose technologies and tools to support product quality, surveillance, and compliance activities. And OPQ's research program is more forward-looking, anticipating and answering regulatory questions related to pharmaceutical quality and paving the way for new um, regulatory policy. We focus efforts on evaluating new and emerging technologies, developing and validating methods for advanced analytics, forecasting generics, and supporting the review and assessment of complex drug products. As I've said, OPQ and OGD work together on gadufa funded research focused on complex products as well as in other areas. The offices identify complex products where there's a need for additional research to better understand the relationships between the complex product, the manufacturing process, and the formulation. Uh, we work together to develop research plans and to assemble internal and external subject matter experts who then conduct collaborative research. And the goal is to take our, resu our results and use them to inform review decisions and guidances, because for complex drugs, Applying the standard approaches to characterize and determine pharmaceutical equivalents and bioequivalents can be challenging. Analytical characterization is necessary in drug development, in manufacturing, and in post-market evaluation. For characterizing complex products, we often need to look beyond simple analysis and standard approaches. It's necessary to determine first, what are the critical attributes that are important for a particular product? What are the attributes that need to be focused on during reverse engineering or demonstration of in vitro sameness in the development of a new generic product? It's also necessary to understand the relationship between formulation, in vivo performance, and the manufacturing process. Analytical characterization is used in this step also to elucidate these relationships. And with all of this information, we can determine what analytical characterization is necessary to demonstrate pharmaceutical equivalence and bioequivalence of a new generic complex product. A scientific approach to characterization of complex products necessarily includes 
considering how many uh, critical attributes need to be identified and then measured and monitored so that we have confidence that if the entire set of attributes is characterized for a complex product, it's sufficient to demonstrate pharmaceutical equivalence and bioequivalence. One example of a characterization challenge associated with complex products is the particle size distribution of globules in cyclosporin ophthalmic emulsions. Globule size distribution is a critical in vitro property for determining bioequivalence in these locally acting topical emulsions. Different manufacturing techniques can manipulate the final particle size distribution. And just because you have the same components, that doesn't mean that you'll get the same end product. And it's likely that particle size affects drug distribution, and it may also impact overall drug release. So this critical attribute really needs to be monitored during manufacturing. And the challenge is how to measure particle size and particle size distribution for this product. In OTR, we measured the particle size distribution by six different particle sizing techniques. Each technique has strengths and limitations depending on the sample, the state of the dispersion, and the particle size range. So how can the results from the different methods be compared? What is or what are the most appropriate methods for measuring globule size in these products? And how should this critical attribute be monitored in these products? Questions like these need to be considered when developing an analytical characterization strategy for a complex product. gadufa funded collaborative research done by OPQ and OGD aims to address challenges like this one. Our work has resulted in a number of product specific guidances and publications to guide analytical method development for generic complex drug products. For example, we've produced a guidance for using morphology directed Raman spectroscopy for selective particle size distribution measurements in generic nasal suspension drug products. This represents an alternative to clinical endpoint studies, which can be very expensive and difficult to conduct. And here I've referred to two manuscripts we've produced on this topic. We've developed LC HRMS methods and workflows to compare impurity profiles for therapeutic peptide peptide drugs made recombinantly or made synthetically. And we've provided guidance to support the development of characterization methods for these types of products. This guidance I'm referring to here was just updated in May of 2021. Our updated guidance on conjugated estrogens, a complex API, provides recommendations to industry and a starting point for demonstrating API sameness using ultra high performance liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. And New products require new analytical methods. As Dr. Cesar discussed, synthetic oligonucleotide therapeutics are an evolving drug class, and they pose unique scientific and regulatory challenges. We're developing high-resolution accurate mass, mass spectrometry methods for characterization, for quality control, and stability testing of these new products, with the intent of being able to provide guidance to industry and facilitate OPQ's review of the characterization data. So this afternoon, we have a breakout session on complex products analysis. And in the first talk in that session, Dr. Rosario Labrudo of Sandoz Pharmaceuticals is going to provide industry perspective on the gaps in complex generic product characterization. Our discussion may include gaps in instrumentation, challenges in sample prep, um, the types of, of products that may need more focus by the FDA, and issues that are surrounding the cost of uh, uh, surrounding the cost and accessibility of acquiring new instrumentation. In the second subsession, Dr. Darby Kozak of OGD will discuss the demonstration of complex generic product equivalence and what to consider when using new analytical methods. Our discussion may cover new analytical methods for characterizing drug products, including particle size distribution and phase distribution in liposomes, microspheres, and emulsions, and may also include analyzing for impurities in macromolecules like um, peptides and oligonucleotides.
Our next two talks cover the, the field of in vitro and in vivo bioequivalence approaches, exploring challenges and opportunities. The first talk is by Beatrice North, who is the Senior Director of Global Clinical Affairs at Perigo Pharmaceuticals. She has over 25 years of experience in clinical program design and execution for both NDA and ANDA phase 1 through 4 clinical trials in various therapeutic areas. She is also an accomplished clinical researcher and operations leader with experience in the area of clinical trial design, management, strategic planning and execution, regulatory compliance, policy development and risk mitigation, quality data collection and analysis. She will be sharing an industry perspective on challenges and opportunities of complex clinical bioequivalence studies. Her talk will be followed by a talk of, from the FDA given by Dr. Partha Roy, who is currently the director of, of the Office of Bioequivalence in the FDA's Office of Generic Drugs. Dr. Roy is a recognized leader in the area of clinical and regulatory strategy with over 21 years of drug development experience in both US FDA and industry setting involving new drugs, novel biologic, generics, and biosimilars. Prior to his current role, Dr. Roy was the Vice President of Paraxel's Regulatory and Access Consulting Global Business Unit. His talk will offer an FDA's perspective on advancing regulatory science through innovative bioequivalence approaches. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. I'm happy to be here with you all and for this opportunity to share some of the challenges that my colleagues and I have experienced from the clinical operations aspect of conducting complex bioequivalent studies over the years. Through these collected opinions, I wish to share some of those I wish we knew moments as we planned and executed our programs despite many unknowns. Today, I would like to first remind us all that this is a partnership with a common goal to bring affordable quality medication to the general public. We've all seen numerous published reports over the years showing that billions of dollars are saved by Americans through generic product use. In fact, the Journal of American Medical Association has reported that generics can cost as much as 80% less than brands. And the Association of Accessible Medicine reported that generics account for 90% of prescriptions filled in the US, but only 22% of all drug costs. So my objectives here are to provide insight to a few of the challenges experienced by industry in the conduct of complex bioequivalent studies, and to share some of what I believe are opportunities to circumvent those challenges, save time to bringing more generic products to market, and save Americans billions more. And of course, my disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed today are those of my own, and some collected from my distinguished colleagues at Perigo, but should not be attributed to Perigo with whom I am employed. Now, the entire process of bringing a product to market is a balancing act of challenges and managed risk, from the strategic selection of pipeline products to considerations of speed to market, or the decisions we make in formulation development or selection of bioequivalent study methodologies to challenge intellectual properties and fluctuations of commercialization. We find ourselves regularly stretched with limited R&D dollars amongst rising costs of clinical studies, but must further evaluate that against prolonged, evolving, and uncertain regulatory processes. And we manage the challenges of access to patients while securing the quality and extrapolation of data from various populations and regions. But keeping in mind that Americans can continue to save tens of billions of dollars over the next decade through the use of generic products Clearly, what we're doing is, at the very least, monumental. So let's be clear. For sponsors, the complexities in drug development and conducting clinical trials are endless. Of course, most of you would know the perils of working with complex molecules and dual compounds, the challenges of Q&Q &Q designation, or the influence of excipients and lot-to-lot -lot variability in the performance of your reference product. We can struggle with lack of guidances and compile questions in our quest for the perfect protocol. Or perhaps you've struggled with insensitive or variable methods, even selection of instruments or technology, or the question of which side of, of administration is most appropriate for your study in the absence of guidances can be difficult. 
but let's also consider the operational challenges in designing and conducting our clinical trials. Study designs can be variable and very complex. The specificity of your entry criteria, balance, and enrollment patterns, and even the sensitivity of your instruments and technologies can all influence your study outcome. Studies may require higher levels of precision in their design, and although this may present more operational challenges, without such precision, your variability may increase and your objectives compromised. So careful and strategic planning of randomization schematics, proper study drug blinding and stratification of treatment kits, sufficient drug supply and drug expiry, they're all essential considerations. There are even increased concerns when relying on self-reported data or unsophisticated data capture systems. And let's not forget the challenges and risks to your programs when protocols are not adhered to. So yes, there are other and numerous factors that can influence or impact your clinical studies. And while I'll share a few of those examples today, the high bar of establishing therapeutic equivalence and superiority with a complex generic product or a complex clinical trial may serve to be the toughest challenge of all. You'll hear more today about metered dose inhalers, but these products in my experience can be quite challenging, particularly when working with limited data or multiple strengths. If not careful in your design, for example, in respiratory and inhalation studies, you could end up with high screen fail rates due to non-responders. There are also lots of potentials for introduced variability in your subjects, technique, or selection of reference product. Or you could experience significant variability in your data if your instruments and training are not standardized or your analytical method is not robust. In fact, highly specialized device components for drug delivery can create significant concerns for drug developers, as we must consider functionality and interchangeability. While the FDA has provided ample information over recent years on the bioequivalence elements of complex generic drug device combinations, further information and guidance is still needed on device comparisons. And the bar for approval of generic metered dose inhalers can be higher than for innovator products. An innovator product need only prove function for regulatory approval, but interchangeability is only determined after FDA review and after the sponsor has invested considerable more time and cost to develop the product. FDA expectations for generic developers remain unclear when branded companies alter their devices. And if FDA determines the interchangeability standards are not met, Redesign of the device may be required, as would engineering and molding, tooling and validation before having to redo performance testings or human factor studies. From a business perspective, the high cost of device constituents, significant development time and investment, repeat testing and delay to market may be too risky or a path too steep to be supported by generic pricing for applicants. There are, however, opportunities for support. Much can be gained through set standards and guidances on pass-fail criteria in the conduct of robustness and durability studies. And generic developers can benefit from the collective information gathered by the FDA over time from the industry on potential alternative methodologies and timely updates to guidances, such as their expectations for changes in devices. We can further speak to the challenges with hormonal products and transdermal delivery systems. Generally, for these products, such as testosterone and estrogen, irritation and sensitization studies have required hundreds of hypogonadal or postmenopausal subjects, for example, and up to years and multi-millions to complete the clinical studies. There can be multiple application sites with similar absorption profiles, so selection in the absence of guidances requires us to make some decisions with increased risk. The same is applicable if transference and washing studies are required for controlled non-Q&Q substances, which remain absent from your PSGs. And further, in vitro apparatus are not designed for patches where they would sit in solutions. The absence of such guidances can require significant time in research, back and forth communication with agency divisions, and potential execution of untested innovative designs delaying the process to market. Again, high costs and lengthy paths to market just may not be feasible for generic developers or supported by generic pricing. 
So in the spirit of partnership, the release of guidances to include standardized designs of transference studies and value-added information about best practices and technologies used, including analytical standards or clarity on questions left unanswered, would be of importance. Ultimately, standardized procedures and objective measurements can negate the need for subjective assessments and lost time to market. In addition, industry can also benefit from getting more timely feedback through controlled correspondence in the absence of guidances in lieu of requesting pre-development meetings, which can lead to an additional loss of time. Now, let's touch on corticosteroids. When working with weak acting steroids through the conduct of vasoconstrictor assay studies, we've been witness to unconventional performance, including better blanching profiles in some patient populations over others, or just greater difficulty blanching, as with irritating APIs that can impact your blanching profiles. The established ED50s and subject qualification rates seen in dose response studies may not always be reproducible in your pivotal bioequivalent studies. This can result in repeat dose response studies and lost time as we explore the potential of product variability, as we've seen in cases of varying lots. So might there be opportunities where the use of more homogeneous populations be acceptable to the agency for those more complex steroids? Might there be more information or clarity that the agency can provide around such complex products? I believe there's much that can be learned through collective research and data available to the agency on variable APIs, identification of best dose durations through dose response relationships, or design nuances such as occlusion when possible, and even through value-added data of failed studies. Now, while not specific to just topical products, some additional challenges experienced by generic developers can include difficulty securing enough quantity of a single lot of reference product or an inability to pursue products where the RLD is not readily available in the US. While we all understand that RLD sourced abroad can be a major point of contention due to the concern of differences in manufacturing sites and equipment used, the challenges remain of how do we conduct our clinical programs when the RLD remains unavailable to us in the US? Might there be some characterization studies of RLD from different regions that can be done with our GADUFA dollars whether in in vitro or in vivo settings, particularly for those more variable products. Publish research of characterizing relationships for the purpose of standardization and moving the needle on this topic would be of significant value to the industry. In addition, there are also cases when product-specific guidances have recommended primary efficacy time points that go beyond maximum efficacy of the product or at least beyond the point of initial statistical significance for efficacy. So we have to ask, is this really necessary? Might there be better guidances provided for those cases where bioequivalence can be established with reduced time points if maximum efficacy can be substantiated? And further, we've struggled with labels that describe application amounts as use small amount, use pea size, use a generous amount. In the absence of a dosing card or clear application instructions, variability in the data may be increased. So any opportunity to seek greater clarity in your guidances from the agency on this matter would also be helpful. And last but not least, the inclusion of a placebo control arm as depicted by FDA is recommended to demonstrate that the test product and the RLD are active and that the study is sufficiently sensitive to detect differences at the lower end of the dose response curve. While well, sometimes our challenges are compounded by poor acting products and variable data, so the inclusion of a placebo can often increase the challenges of conducting clinical bioequivalent studies exponentially. And despite recent updates to some guidances for IVPT options, those formulations that are not Q and Q will not qualify for IVPT and will still require those lengthy clinical bioequivalence programs. Establishing superiority can be nearly impossible for some products that are only modestly effective, particularly in studies of self-limiting conditions with subjective endpoints and limited data available. Needless to say, the design challenges with anticipated variability and expected high placebo effect has resulted in sample size that run in the thousands posing enrollment and compliance challenges as subjects self-initiate therapy due to the discomfort or lack of efficacy. 
and the cost of these studies can run into tens of millions and oftentimes forces to recruit subjects abroad for improved compliance, potential cost savings, and subjects with less access to available therapies than subjects in the U.S. We also ask ourselves, is it really appropriate to include a placebo arm in studies that evaluate anti-effectives or necessary if the margin of efficacy between the actives and the placebo are extremely wide? I believe industry could be supported by comparative case studies from the data collected by the FDA to evaluate the need for placebo in some of those cases described and better discern when the inclusion of a placebo is necessary or not. So, in summary, we all share similar challenges and one common obligation to save Americans billions with quality, affordable medications. Indeed, there are numerous factors that can impact our efforts or timeliness to market, including the numerous barriers mentioned today. But likewise, there are opportunities for data-driven and science-based approaches for bioequivalents that can be extrapolated from collected data, transparency of alternative methodologies, and timely updates to product-specific guidances that include information about best practices and technologies used, or analytical standards, or clarity on pending questions. As we explore opportunities to circumvent the challenges faced by generic developers, we look to the support of the industry and the FDA to share value-added data and alternative approaches for bioequivalents in the conduct of complex bioequivalent studies. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to share these opinions. Good morning. My name is Partha Roy. As the new director for the Office of Bioequivalence in the Office of Genetic Drugs, I'm pleased to welcome all of you this morning. In the next 10 minutes, I will try and highlight some of the areas where there are great opportunities for advancing regulatory science through innovative bioequivalence approaches and where we think that targeted research can bring fundamental and perceptible changes. I will start with a usual disclaimer. This presentation represents the views and perspectives of the speaker and does not necessarily reflect the views of the US FDA. Here is the outline of my talk and the four areas where we can close the gap on regulatory research supporting generic drug development and approval. First, impact of food on bioequivalence. Second, biopharmaceutics classification system, or in other words, BCS, class three waiver. Third, bio waiver for lower strengths. And finally, novel in vivo B study designs. First, as we operate today, FDA requires both fasted and fed in vivo BE studies for all immediate release products, unless the products are exclusively labeled to be taken on an empty stomach. That is, the labeling states that the product should be administered at least one hour before or two hours after a meal. Now, this is fundamentally a different approach compared to almost all other advanced international health agencies where only fasting study is recommended for immediate release products. So the question is, can we identify opportunities for a broad harmonization such that only fasting B studies are recommended for the establishment of bioequivalence in majority of the cases, barring some exceptions? I think we may be able to but we are not there yet. We need to have a better understanding of the physiological microenvironment and the gastrointestinal transit of drug products under both fasting and fed conditions, and then be able to put together a mechanistic absorption modeling and simulation to assess risk of bioinequivalence attributable to food intake in virtual populations. And there are some research that are going on within OGD. Second, the challenges and opportunities to support BCS class three drug waiver. Now BCS class three drug waiver has been under intense discussion and with FDA's May 2021 M9 BCS based waiver guidance 
for BCS class 3 drug products, those products that exhibit high solubility and low permeability, where the test product formulation should be qualitatively the same and quantitatively very similar, that is Q1, Q2. Now, BCS class 3 drug substances are considered to be more susceptible to the effects of excipients compared to, say, BCS class 1 drug products, which on the other hand exhibit high solubility and high permeability. Currently, for BCS class 3 drugs, all of the excipients should be qualitative, qualitatively the same and quantitatively similar. That is, within plus minus 10% of the amount of excipients in the reference product and the cumulative difference for these excipients should be within plus minus 10%. Can we now envision situations where we can expand BCS class 3 biowaver to non-Q1, Q2 drug products? To get there, we realize we need to have a better understanding and predictability of excipient and absorption interplay that is likely guided by excipient impact on various drug as well as physiological parameters, including solubility, permeability, physiology of the gastrointestinal tract, including intestinal transporters and drug metabolizing enzyme activities. It is important to identify the same or the safe range of excipients for a list of drugs for which systemic exposure is less likely to be affected. Now, it is impractical to investigate endless possible combinations of BCS class 3 drugs and commonly used excipients one by one. Rather, we can assess these permutations in physiologically relevant in vitro systems and then transitioning the data into systemic exposure using modeling and simulation approaches. If we can reliably do that, we can certainly see a future state where BioWaver can be supported for non-Q1, Q2 BCS class 3. Third, by waivers for lower strengths. Before that, I would like to define the term biowaiver. The term biowaiver can refer to either the decision to waive an in vivo BE requirement under 21 CFR 32022, or the decision to accept in vitro BE data in lieu of an investig in vivo investigation in accordance with 21 CFR 32024. We currently recommend that applicants demonstrate compositional proportionality between non-bio study strengths and the bio study strength, along with comparable dissolution profiles to support bio waiver requests. However, there may be a scope to grant a waiver for strengths that do not meet these criteria if a better understanding can be obtained on the impact of such deviations on bioequivalence. Deviation in compositional proportionality can be supported by increased knowledge of the impact of certain excipients on phys physiochemical characteristics of the API and on gut wall transporters and enzymes. A better understanding of the role of certain excipients in a given formulation can also allow for a relaxation of the composition compositional proportionality criteria. Deviations in dissolution similarity can be addressed through an identification of a dissolution safe space, or in other words, sort of a design space where we can be confident that differences in dissolution profiles will not translate to bio inequivalence. Establishment of biopredictive dissolution methods along with the use of PBPK and PBBM techniques may allow us to confidently grant biowaivers even in the absence of comparable dissolution profiles and formulation proportionality. Last, I will touch upon the novel in vivo B evaluation pathways. There is a significant lack in generic drug approvals for long-acting injectables and oncology products due to cost 
and challenges when conducting in vivo clinical studies, which is identified as a real barrier for getting these generics approved. So the question is, can we adapt novel study designs to reduce the regulatory burden of demonstrating BE for some of these drug products? Novel in vivo two-stage or a multi-stage adaptive trial designs have been utilized in many new drug applications as well as in some ANDA applications that have been employed to reduce sample size as well as study duration. Now, opportunities do exist to generate evidence using sufficiently validated and verified model. We can also utilize a weight of evidence approach leveraging clinically relevant in vitro testing re results. I would like to add that over the last one year or so, COVID-19 pandemic has posed unprecedented challenges to conduct in vivo B studies and often have led to study interruptions. And in many cases, that led to using multiple batches in a single study due to batch expiration, partial data due to patient dropout, or truncated PK curves. Now, under these circumstances, adaptive designs and model-based analysis plan can be useful to support protocol revisions by generic applicants. So in summary, Ongoing and future research provides enormous opportunities to fundamentally change some of our current regulatory bioequivalence approaches and requirements that might allow us to grant more bio waivers and avoid less duplicative and scientifically um, unnecessary study. We can also use novel B designs, advanced in vitro characterization, and novel modeling and simulation approaches to advance and accelerate generic drug approvals. Now, before I end our talk, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my OGD colleagues, Dr. Liang Zhao, who is the director of DQMM within ORS OGD and then Dr. Utpal Munshi, who is the acting director for the Division of Bioequivalence 1 within Office of Bioequivalence, OGD. I would like also like to say that this discussion will be further continued by my FDA and industry colleagues in the afternoon in the breakout session three, where challenges and opportunities with regard to in vitro and in vivo B approaches will be discussed. So please stay tuned. Thank you.